What do you see? Really, when you look at this space, what do you see? Does anybody notice a magnificent organ behind me, hidden by a screen, silent, full of potential? Or perhaps you notice this frame, a proscenium arch indicating a separation between an audience space and a performance space. Or maybe you just see me on a big red dot, because that's what you've been told to see. In fact, you might think it's kind of rude to look at anything but me. Well, for the next 10 minutes or so, I want to encourage you to look for more, to see and re-see this space, because after all, this is a seeing place. The origin of the word theater comes from the Greek word theatron, which literally translates as the seeing place. And that makes sense, right? You go to a theater to see a play or an opera or dance or a talk. You came to this theater today to see a talk. You came to see. And there are rituals associated with this act of seeing. When you arrived, you took your place amongst a community of strangers and peers. You maybe flipped through that tiny, beautiful little program, talked to the person who was sitting next to you, and then all of a sudden, the lights dimmed, the music faded, a hush descended over the crowd, and lights came up on the stage before you. That ritual, the lights, the music, the hush, the focusing of everyone's attention towards one unified point, it teaches you how to see, whether you are conscious of it or not. When the lights go out on you, your experience shifts from one that was maybe communal or centered on the self to one that's centered on the other, in this case, me. Now, this hasn't always been the case. If we go to the origins of Western theater, again, with the Greeks, they took place in these huge open-air amphitheaters where an entire city would join together for day-long festivals as they would watch as narratives would play out in dialogue with them. And they could never turn off or turn down their experience with community. So this shift from dispersed focal points to one unified point, as supported by shifts in audience orientation, the addition of lights, a frame, it completely transformed the rules of the seeing place, what we see and how we see them. Now, I'm a theater director, so my job is to make visible, to take a character, a relationship, an idea, a theme, and make it visible to an audience on stage. So I'm kind of obsessed with this question of how we see and make meaning. And beyond being a theater director, I'm also a director of site-specific immersive theater. Let's break that down. Site-specific theater aims to put narrative in direct relationship to place, often a non-traditional performance site. So instead of building an elaborate set design to look like a library, it would mean performing a piece in an actual library, surrounded by the smell of books. And immersive theater is an orientation in which the audience and performers share the same physical space. It sometimes means that an audience moves through a space to follow performance. So you can imagine moving through a library, through those stacks of books, to see a love scene happen against the backdrop of the poetry section, or peering through that tiny little space between the books and the shelving units to see as two characters scheme in private with each other. Site-specific and immersive theater completely changes how we see by subverting the traditional understandings of the performer audience dynamic. And in my very biased opinion, I think it helps us see more. The simple yet significant shift of moving an audience out of the dark and out of a stationary position to have them move through this piece, a place activates their agency. And immersing an audience in a place puts their, um, all of their senses on fire. And I think it deepens their relationship with place. When I began work on a new piece of site-specific theater with a huge team of collaborators, we began with a site, the Georgetown Steam Plant, a national historic site located on the south side of Seattle that opened in 1907 to power Seattle's streetcars. 
I remember walking into that building for the first time and looking up at these towering turbines, peering down a boiler room that seemed to go on forever, and noticing the dust and oil that had accumulated from nearly half a century of inaction. It's the type of space that reads like a palimpsest, layer upon layer of meaning, like ghosts embedded in the architecture. And spaces that feel like a palimpsest are a site-specific director's dream. It's my job to uncover those layers, look for the stories that live inside of them, and let them inform a piece. So as we began to enter the archives, engage in conversations with local historians, we began to hear the stories in this space. First layer, Frank and Lillian Gilbreth. 19th century power couple, trailblazing efficiency engineers, the architects of the Georgetown steam plant, and the inspiration for the book, play, and eventual movies, Cheaper by the Dozen. Now, Frank is credited solely with the design of the Georgetown steam plant, but when you look at the design, you can see that it was clearly informed by years of time motion and fatigue studies that both Frank and Lillian pioneered. In these time motion studies, they would study the ways in which often factory workers would proceed with their jobs, and they would synthesize a range of movements to 17 basic actions. And then they would organize a space and sequence the actions to maximize efficiency. Now, there are clear economic incentives for efficient workplaces. But an anecdote from a children's book about the Gilbreths suggests perhaps a different reason. In this book, one of the dozen children is pleading with their parents for a puppy. And Frank and Lillian hem and ha over this decision. Frank says, but think of all the chores, all the responsibility. And then Lillian knowingly glances to Frank and says, but think of all the happiness minutes they'll accrue. Sure enough, all those process charts, all those time motion and fatigue studies had an aim of eventually increasing happiness, and dare I say, meaning. So when I returned to that enormous space that they built and thought of their research, those happiness minutes, I re-saw the space as a place of potential, housing two state-of-the-art Curtis turbines designed to power a booming city. And then in 1912, just five years after the steam plant opened, there were smaller, more efficient turbines. And the Curtis turbines now looked cumbersome and inefficient. And then not long after that, Seattle's electric companies consolidated and the workforce dwindled. And then not long after that, Seattle voted to straighten the Duwamish River away from the Georgetown steam plant, thus cutting off its source of energy and relegating it from, being, from powering the streetcars to all of a sudden only being used for backup power supply during peak hours of energy consumption. A building losing its purpose. Work losing its meaning. And then... And I will never forget learning this as I stood in this five-story building. But for the last 20-odd years, just four workers had the job of maintaining that enormous space so that if, and only if, the Seattle called with a citywide emergency, they would be ready to power up the plant as backup power. And the city never called and the doors to the Georgetown steam plant shut in the 1970s. Four workers in that enormous space for over 20 years powering nothing. After reading through every layer, I continued to re-see this space. Whereas once I saw those turbines of representations of power and potential, I now saw them as reminders of the consequences of prog progress. And when I added the layer of the Gilbreths and their research, I thought about the ways that we can lose our connection to meaning or purpose in our work. 
And when I zoomed out even further and looked at the histories of this site in relationship to Seattle now, a city growing exponentially at a rate infrastructure cannot possibly keep up with, I saw the reason to do a piece. So in 2016, I co-directed We Remain Prepared, a site-specific and immersive piece inspired by and staged throughout the Georgetown steam plant that grappled with the consequences of progress and asked us how we make meaning for ourselves when the systems of meaning-making fail us. The entire process, from research produ to production, helped me re-see a space I drive past every day on my way to work. And I think it allowed the audience to do the same. Site-specific and immersive theater offers us an invaluable model for how to see more. So when you look again at this space, I invite you to see its many layers as a chapel, as a library, as an auditorium. When you look at McMinnville, I encourage you to see its rapid industrial and agricultural growth. See the stolen land that we stand on. See a town, a state known as McMinnville, Oregon, once submerged in water. See what was, see what is, see what can be. But whatever you do, choose to see. Choose to see more. Thank you.